You're listening to the Badass Lady Folk Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Stoddard. Yeah! Hey there, folks. I know there's been a bit of a uh, hiatus, shall we say? <laughs> I promise I'm okay. I am alive. If you've looked at my social media, then you know that 2022 was full of other kinds of creative projects. I had a lot of visual art. I had my writing per usual. Also had a ton of theater and film work. And these were blessings, right? I am not complaining. But I will say that in addition to all of that awesome creative stuff, I also had a major personal life change. I got divorced. And... I survived. <laughs> so big transition, big transformation, really. And I came out on the other end of it. Okay. So I'm back. I'm back on the podcast. I am back here doing the badass lady folk. That much has not changed. Yes, we had to jump forward in time and skip a year in order for you to get back to listening to me again and hearing all the fabulous women and non-binary folks that I interview on this podcast. I did not disappear. I am not disappearing. This podcast is not going away. <laughs> it is an earworm. It is here to stay. I'd like to welcome Megan J. Meehan to the Badass Lady Folk Podcast. Megan J. Meehan is a published author, poet, cartoonist, and produced playwright. She is a freelance journalist, a college level educator, and the founder of the Conscious Perceptionalism Art Practice. Welcome, Megan. Thank you for having me, Christine. It's a big honor to be here. Yeah, of course. And I should let our audience members know that I am a plagiarist. I just read your bio directly from your website. I did not reword oh, anything. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I gave you permission to do that. Thank you. So you're not tell plagiarizing me. You're citing me. <laughs> yeah, I'm citing you. I cited my sources. You're right. Not a plagiarist. All right. Well, I would love for our listeners to get a sense of your visual art because it is so unusual. Uh, it's not the sort of overtly political feminist art that I have featured on the show in the past. So could you paint listeners a picture? What does your art look like? My art is sort of a cross between uh, Joan Moreau and Alexander Calder. If you know those two artists with maybe a little bit of uh, Henri Matisse, and if you know those artists, then you can kind of get an idea of my style. It's very, very abstract. It's very colorful. Um, so it's a lot of bright colors, and some of them are a little bit more muted, and interesting shapes. And my work is also three-dimensional. So it includes a lot of found objects, and includes a lot of recycled materials, such as bottle caps and little pieces of plastic that would normally just be thrown away. If they're of an interesting shape, I will recycle them into my artwork. And um, my pieces are essentially these crazy little sculptural wall hangings, outrageous sculptural wall hangings. And they're essentially these things that should probably not exist, but do. And essentially their whole purpose is to make people smile. So if, if you look at one of my pieces at, and if, you, if it makes you stop and makes you stare and makes you think, oh my goodness, what is that? But if it gives you even a second of wonder or happiness or joy, as far as I'm concerned, they've done their job. Um, many of them can be turned in any direction. Uh, in the beginning, you did mention that I'm the founder of the Conscious Perceptionalism Art Practice. Now, I will say that I did make up the word perceptionalism. And what this basically means is that when you are making work that is, uh, that is in the Conscious Perceptionalism style, what you're doing is that you are consciously creating work that can be perceived from any direction. Many of my pieces are either rigged on the back to turn on a wall. They have turned, actually have little these little turntables on the back. And when they're mounted to a wall, they can be turned in any direction. Uh, some of the smaller ones are wired four ways on the back. 
And what that means is that they can be hung from any direction. So there is no definitive left, right, up or down. It's simply whatever way you think it looks the best hanging. Because if you hang it one way, you'll see different shapes than if you hang it another way. Um, so essentially, the, because of that, it's very playful. And it just kind of opens you up to different possibilities and different things that you can see. And all of my work, even though there's nothing political about my work at all, at least not not supposed to be. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I'm still recovering from pneumonia. It's um very it's very playful, and it does speak to combating depression, combating anxiety, and allowing yourself to have a moment of joy and have a moment of wonder. And that is so important because I think a lot of people today are very, very stressed out and stress causes all kinds of health issues. Depression causes issues, it causes behavioral problems, it causes bad decisions. It just causes a lot of just anger and frustration that subsequently cause problems for people in their professional lives, their personal lives, what have you. And I just feel like if there is, in the art world, there should be more welcome to pieces that are colorful and are bright and are happy because there's nothing wrong with feeling happy you know th there was a there's a, a train of philosophy that basically says that every that the goal in life is the pursuit of happiness so if you have art that helps you feel happy it's joyous and there's nothing wrong with that and i feel that it just kind of plays into taking care of your mental health so not political but still important in my opinion yeah, and I would argue that that mentality, that philosophy is political because we do live in a go, go, go capitalist society, so much competition, so much stress, not enough of a safety net for people in terms of all kinds of things, mental health being one of them, right? We just don't have so many different support systems in place, um, and not just for people who have a diagnosis but really for anyone mental health is something that all of us should be aware of should care about and there's still such a huge stigma so i commend you for making objects i would call them object objects they look to me like um sculptural paintings or objects uh, because like like you said they're three-dimensional right sculptural um, wall hangings yeah sculptural <laughs> wall hangings <laughs> gotta get the artist statement right um yeah I commend you for putting an emphasis on playfulness and cheer and happiness could you talk more about how bright colors make you happy or how you think they can make others happy um, well, there's a lot of research that has gone into the impact that colors have on people. Um, so, for instance, uh, one of the more interesting studies, um, have you ever traveled a, a, on like a highway and seen that a lot of the signs are green? The reason that a lot of the signs are green is because green is a very calming color. And they think that it's a way to keep motors calm <laughs> and to prevent things like road rage. And that was a study from many, many years ago. But it's just interesting that they made road signs green for that reason. Um, in similar fashion, I think it, I think it started, although don't, don't quote me on this because I don't know exactly. I'd have to do some research into it. But I think it was like in the mid 20th century, a lot of hospitals, they started painting them in this kind of mint green color, this light green color. Um, because again, that was a color that was considered very, very soothing. Whereas colors like red or like, um, very bright corals were not as common in hospital settings because they said that it could kind of put people more on alert and they were trying to keep things nice and calm. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of a lot of restaurants like red because red has a very kind of rich um, rich background, kind of like, it, it makes you feel kind of luxurious essentially, uh, the same way that purple does to a lot of places. Um, so it's interesting, like, so there, there have been studies that colors can impact how people feel. And, you know, me personally, I just love colors. And I feel that colors are just, you know, I'm not, I'm not very religious. I suppose if you were very religious, you would say colors are a gift from God. But I guess colors are kind of a gift from the universe, if you want to say it that way, where we have these bright colors in the world that are there to be enjoyed. 
And if you watch nature programs, like I absolutely love watching nature programs on PBS, you would be amazed by all the colors that are in nature, especially under the sea. And I mean, even um, if you've ever seen sulfur rocks, there are like these really bright yellow rocks. And these are all colors that are found in nature. And it's just amazing, like the, the colors that the natural world holds, that humans have been inspired by those, by that natural world to create paints that mimic those colors. So I feel that when you put a lot of color into artwork, it's almost like a little bit of an ode to the world in general. A lot of people could look at my art as little odes to society because it's all these different colors and different shapes coming together. The same way that society is a patchwork, especially places like New York, is a patchwork of people, you know, different backgrounds, different cultures, different walks of life, different professions, or kind of coming together. And you could say the same thing for the ecosystem. Look at any ecosystem because everything depends on everything else. That's why a lot of problems with global warming today and a lot of issues arise because if one species goes extinct or one species gets into trouble, it can have a chain reaction on everything else. Because it, it's kind of like that old song when we were kids, like the, what is it, like the head bones connected to the neck bone, everything's connected. And I find that that's really true, whether you're dealing with society or ecosystems or our bodies, um, everything in the world is connected. And a lot of my art can almost be viewed as little worlds within themselves where everything kind of informs everything else. Ooh, I love that little worlds. Could you talk <laughs> about how you choose your color combinations? And could you talk about some of your favorite color combinations for your artwork? Well, my color combinations, I am, this is an interesting question because I actually use a lot of colors that are just traditionally very complementary to each other. That's how I, that's how I started. So like I, I have um, pieces where I'll put a lot of maybe blacks and whites and golds together with a little bit of bronze. I'll put greens and blues together, you know, some reds, yellows, oranges, maybe with a little splash of purple. And these are colors that are, you know, traditionally look very nice together. But then I decided to challenge myself. Now, I've started creating a series um, called the Voca um, Lavish Lexicon Collection, which is basically a series with very fancy vocabulary-centered titles because uh, I'm working on a PhD right now and my main focus is vocabulary. I love vocabulary words. And the, English, and the English language is so bored and it's so fun to see these obscure words and, in and use art to introduce them to people. So the vocabulary collection has very fancy titles. But the other fun thing about the vocabulary collection is I decided when I was creating this collection that I was going to go out of my way to make these very, very unusual color combinations. So I was going to find a way to use these pieces to make pretty art using colors that normal people would never think to put together. So I have pieces with like um, flesh tone beige paired with like maroon, paired with like light blue. I mean, colors that should look terrible together, but somehow I can make it work. And a lot of the reason I can make it work is that I use a lot of glitter and rhinestones in my art because glitter just makes everything better. Nothing is bad that sparkles. <laughs> so essentially, um, that's how I kind of bring these together. But it's funny because in these pieces, um, I bring together these colors that you would never in a thousand years think to put together and somehow they work. And I look at it and think, hmm, that's interesting. And I actually make notes to myself to mix this color, to, to put something together like this color with this color with this color, just so that it's kind of in my head to do that in the future. And I actually make little notes on my phone if I see different hues and I'm like, oh, I haven't played with that color. I'm going to play with that color and I'll mix it with something kind of unusual like this color. Um, My favorite color combination, uh, that's a harder thing to answer. It's a terrible, terrible thing to ask an artist is what is your favorite color? Because I love all colors. I'd say if I was pushed, I would say my favorite color is probably royal blue or cobalt blue. That's probably my favorite color. Um, but again, I love all colors. So it's really difficult to ask me that. But I would say my favorite color combination. I really love it when there's a combination of like this red orange color with yellow with blue. I just think I know it's very primary colors, but I just think that they look so beautiful together. And I also really like pairing um, orange with purple. I think they look very good together. Um, and then, of course, there's classics like black and white. Or you can switch it up and do like black and cream. That always looks nice together. 
Um, so I mean, I really just, I mean, but again, it's it's very difficult for me to choose a color combination because I really do love all colors. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great problem to have to appreciate all colors. So could you discuss why you have made your works three-dimensional? What is it that you like about this sculptural quality? Um, that's a good question. So the way that this started is that back in 2012, uh, something in my head just snapped. And I just thought to myself, you know, what would happen if I put clay on canvas. Now, what, what would happen? Would it look good? Would it fall off? And, well, let's give it a try. So I knew that I couldn't put regular clay on canvas. That would be a disaster. But I found very lightweight clay, and I started to sculpt it, because I, I always loved to sculpt ever since I was a kid. I loved to sculpt, and I loved to paint. So I thought, what would happen if I combined them? Just what, what would happen? So I found very lightweight clay, and I sculpted something. I let it dry, and then I attached it to the canvas, and I painted the canvas, I painted the clay, and then I added little bits and pieces, like found objects. Um, sometimes I would add polymer clay, which is just like um, the clay that I sculpt with the hand sculpt, except instead of air drying that, you actually put it in the oven and bake it. And that's great because it already has the colors on it in order to paint it. Um, a lot of people use it to make jewelry as well. It's a very nice medium. Um, and I would combine that into pieces. And then I would go ahead and add some rhinestones, of course, just to make it shiny. So in 2012, when I started doing these uh, 3D works, um, I don't even know where the idea really came to me. I guess it's because I was always a fan of artists like Moreau and Calder and Matisse and Kadinsky. Um, I always loved these artists. And Calder was a sculptor. He did work in sculpture a lot. But I just thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to try to make three-dimensional work? Because it's something that I had not seen these artists do, you know, sculptural wall hangings. So I thought, you know, I'm going to make this my own style. Let's just see what happens. And back in 2012, there was a gallery in Greenport on Long Island. And it was called the South Street Gallery. And they used to have this little 10 by 10 show. And every artist was allowed to submit up to three works to the show. So I had them. They were very nice. I had them mail me three boards. And I created different art on each one. And different color schemes. So one was um, blue and purple and green. And then one was red and orange and yellow. And then one was black and white, primarily. There were some other colors in them, but those were the three. And they were all named after fantasy cities. So one was called El Dorado, one was called Atlantis, and one was called Camelot. So Camelot was the black and white one. Atlantis was the blue, green, purple one. And El Dorado was the yellow, um, orange, red one. And they also had some gold and silver in them and whatnot. And I sent them out to the gallery. And when the show was over, I called the gallery about picking up my pieces. And the woman at the gallery told me that two of the three had sold. Um, Atlantis and El Dorado had sold. And I initially started arguing with this poor woman on the phone. Oh, no, they couldn't have sold. <laughs> I've never sold work, old work. They're really abstract because a lot of the pieces in the show were um, very realistic. You know, they were beach scenes, they were portraits. And then you had these crazy abstract sculptural wall hangings. And the lady was assuring me, no, they sold, they sold. So I ended up getting Camelot back. I still have Camelot and I still show it off every chance that I get because I still really like that piece. But I started showing at this show every single November. And over the years, you know, the South Street Gallery since closed and another gallery, VSOP Projects, has taken over the show. And now they're getting so many submissions that it's one work per artist per year. But I still submit every single year and mostly every year I sell. So I've been very fortunate with that. And I love that show. And it always challenges me to make new and unique work. And, you know, it's just, it's very joyous to be able to sell work. And I, I like to say that my pieces don't get purchased, they get adopted. And I like to see them go to good homes. And probably the the highlight of my career as an artist so far, or one of the greatest highlights, was that I sold a piece of work at one of those shows, and it was pink and purple and white. It was very girly. And I heard from the buyer, and the buyer was a grandmother who purchased that piece to give to her granddaughter as a present on Christmas Day. And Christmas is my favorite holiday, and the little girl loved it, I was told. So that just made my day. That was probably the 
the best thing I've ever heard. And then the other sale that I got also through that show was the same year I made that was that was back when they were still doing three um three a year allowed. So I did that really like bright purple pink one for a little girl's room. But I also did one that was very dignified. It was gold and it was silver and it was bronze. And that one sold to a, an English professor who worked out of Stony Brook University. And it was in her living room and everybody commented on it and loved it. So that was cool. And it, it's just interesting to see, you know, who has adopted my work. I know that um, a Greek sheep, a Greek shipping billionaire bought one of my pieces in the city and it's currently hanging in his house in park avenue um i know that somebody else bought a little toy a, a wreath that i did for this um arsenal gallery in central park has this annual wreath interpretation show around christmas and i sold a toy wreath there that a guy hangs on his door every christmas now and i just sold another happy face wreath that a guy that collects um um smiley face art <laughs> bought and it's just great to see you know, where my art goes. I sold another little piece in a show uh, that I, I submit these tiny pieces to this thing called uh, Postcards from the Edge, which is a show that that they have every January in Manhattan. And it benefits people that are suffering from AIDS and it raises money and it raises awareness. And I, um, I, I sold pieces there. And one of the pieces I sold was to a lady who used to write for um, rock and roll magazines. And she had interviewed Slash from Guns N' Roses, which is like one of my favorite bands. And she's such an interesting lady. And she bought one of my pieces and she has it in her house. And it's just great to see where they go and that they give people happiness and joy. And I'm always happy when I see them get adopted to good homes. Yeah, what a treat. I love how you call it adoption. I do want to ask, as somebody who is based in one of the five boroughs, how aware of you or how much do you keep tabs of or how much do you even care about the New York art scene? I keep tabs of it a lot. I mean, it's very helpful to be where I am because I do a lot of work on Long Island and I do a lot of work in the city. Um, there's just a lot of opportunities around. And what I like about it is that I... Basically, I, I subscribe to a lot of different arts newsletters, and that's where I find a lot of opportunities and calls for artists. And that's actually how I find out about a lot of galleries and a lot of opportunities. Um, so I think being based here is very helpful just because there is so much room for the arts here. I mean, you have calls for artists from galleries, which is always wonderful, but libraries are also willing to show art. Um, there is a wonderful theater in Manhattan called Theater for the New City. They're a very well-known theater, and they do art shows in their lobbies uh, twice a year. They usually do one around November, December, like around Christmas, and then they do another one typically around like April or May, around the spring. Um, and it's just a nice place to show work and get exposure. I have sold work there, actually. Um, but it's just interesting to see where art can be displayed and all the different opportunities. I had art displayed in restaurants, for example. Um, and I think it's because New Yorkers are just very open to allowing opportunities for the artists. And I don't know if it, if that would be quite as prevalent in other parts of the country, especially for an artist like me who makes work that's very cheerful. But it's also very out there and very different. You know, if you're looking for a nice peaceful sunset or a portrait or flowers, you'd probably be pretty horrified if you saw my work. <laughs> I love your mention of New Yorkers appreciating art everywhere. And as a transplant, that's something that I've always adored. Uh, my dad's a New Yorker. My grandparents are New Yorkers, but I'm from Virginia. And growing up, we would come to New York City quite often. Like once a month was not unusual for my family. And from a young age, I knew I wanted to live here because it's just art everywhere all the time. On that note, could you talk about the work that you've done on public art murals? Yes. So I've worked on a few murals. Now, I did not design any murals myself because my work is very abstract, as you know. Um, but I was I, I, I was on the board of this arts organization uh, on Long Island called Westbury Arts. And they did a mural project um, on the side of a grocery store in the town of Westbury, which was right across the street from where they opened the Westbury Art Center in 2021. So my I was not the lead artist, a wonderful mural artist named Marie St. Clair was the lead artist. 
And Marie St. Clair was a lead. I was sort of a teaching artist. I was kind of uh, uh, like the second secondary artist. And then a number of children from the local middle school, we all came together to design a mural. And um, Westbury, the town has a slogan. Uh, um, the, town, the slogan is a, a town or a village for all seasons. So what we did is that we created a mural that was the Four Seasons mural. So it started in the winter, then it went into uh, transitions from winter, spring, summer, fall. And we drew out ideas for what we wanted to see on this mural. We finalized the concept. And then we went out and over a two to three month period, we painted this enormous wall. Um, I believe, I mean, it's over 50 feet long. I think it's like 53 or 57 feet long. And it's probably about 11 or 12 feet high. And it really turned out beautifully. Um, and it's still there now, and, like my and it's cool because they put a plaque on the wall with all our names on it, like the teaching artists and the kids that helped us. And it was really fun. It was hard work, hard work working out in the elements, but it was so worth it because it just, it looks beautiful. I learned a lot from that project. There was a little documentary made about that project. And if you go on my website and look under the movies tabs and you click on the documentary, it will take you to YouTube so you can watch the documentary. Um, a wonderful documentary filmmaker named Clive, Kyle LeClaire created this documentary and he did a wonderful, wonderful job of it. Um, so that was usually rewarding. And that's really my big public art project from year olds. Um, I recently did do a giant sculpture. Well, to me, it was giant. It was about 43 inches wide, 37 inches high, and it has about a 14 inch depth. And that was this big um, sculptural wall hanging that I did for a library on Long Island called the Baldwin Library. And that's actually on permanent exhibition at their lobby now. <laughs> that's amazing. Could you talk more about using found objects in your work? How do you choose what to use? Uh, do you have a collection that you keep or do you sort of find things as you go for each project? How does it work? Well, I am a, I'm basically like a magpie. I love birds. I love all animals, but I'm particularly partial to birds. And I basically, I'm like a magpie. If I see anything shiny, I want it. If a piece of my jewelry breaks, I can't just throw away the bees. I got to collect them in a box because I'll recycle them into art. So what, if, what happens is if I see something that's an interesting shape, I want to keep it. And so, I mean, and, and, and sometimes it comes across as a little bit crazy. Like, for instance, have you ever um, gotten a pizza and they put this little thing in the center of the pizza to keep all the pies together? It's got like a little flat top and it's got like Yeah, a it looks like a dollhouse stuff. table. Yes, I collect those because I put them into my art because I can use them to hang things from. Um, I collect bottle caps. So if I get a bottle of Coke. It's a red bottle cap. I got to keep that. I'll go out and I'll buy, like, um, there's a type of water. I can't remember which brand it is, but they have a green cap. And I'll keep drink the water, keep the cap. I'll keep blue Pepsi caps. Because it's always good when I have caps I don't need to paint. And I keep them. And I just keep them in a bag. And I'll just use them when I need them. So essentially, when I find interesting shapes, I do keep them in bags. And I sort them out. Either like Usually, I sort them out through objects. Like, I have my miscellaneous objects. And then I have, you know, my bottle caps in one bag. My rhinestones in another bag. Um... But I basically keep stuff like that. I keep a lot of bottle caps um, just because it's nice to be able to incorporate that into art. So I don't often collect things as I go. I typically have an idea for, you know, a color or something I want to make or shape of want something to make. And then I'll go through my collection and see what I have to complement that. And it's funny because I, I people that know that I'm into this, if they have like old pieces of jewelry or if they have like old bits and baubles, they'll give it to me to keep in my collection to incorporate into art. So that's always fun. But yeah, I would say I don't really collect things as I go. It's more that I collect things as I see them and then I put them aside. And then when time comes to make art, I'll go through what I have and I'll let what I have sort of inform my work. Yeah, and that's something else that I would argue is political using recycled objects. And I think that's wonderful. I want to shift to your theater work, which is also quite playful and cheerful. Could you talk about the kinds of plays you write and why you write them? I write outrageous plays. That's what I call them. I call them outrageous plays because none of my plays are realistic. 
So essentially, my attitude is this. If I wanted to write a story that is realistic, that's a straightforward drama or a straight, you know, straightforward comedy just involving, you know, people, straightforward drama, I could write a screenplay. And I have written screenplays that are straightforward stories. Um, the theater crowd, however, especially in New York, you can get away with a lot more with the theater crowd than you can with the movie crowd. People who are fans of theater, um, can, uh, especially when you like my type of theater, can definitely be more accepting of experimental, or as I call them, outrageous kind of plays. And things can work in plays that would not work on film quite as well. So what I mean by this, one of my favorite comedy plays, and one of the comedy plays that's been the most popular, is one that you starred in, Christine, called The Value of Gold, Silver, and Bronze, which is sometimes shortened to simply statues. And this is a silly, ridiculous 10-15 minute, 10, 15 minute play about three statues that come to life when their owner is out of the room. You have one that's gold, one that's silver, one that's bronze, and they spend all their time arguing over who is the best. Gold thinks she's the best, silver thinks she's the best, bronze thinks she's the best. Then a thief breaks into their mansion. He has a sack. The sack can only fit one statue, so he's got to decide which one to take. And all of a sudden, the tables turn, and all of the statues are trying to convince the thief to take one of the other two. Because in suddenly, instead of saying, I'm the best, they're saying, I'm the worst. You don't want me. Take one of the other two instead. So it's just this, it's very ridiculous play, but it's also a lot of fun, and there's a lot of play on words. And that one I was inspired by watching um, Living Statues, the performers in the park, like in Central Park, that take on both the living statues. Excuse me. So again, very silly, very playful, but also experimental. Um, I have another play, a, a recent one, and I just found out today that it was accepted into the One Act Play Festival at the Secret Theater in Queens, and it's going to be running in, in March, <clears throat> and it's called Star and Guardian. And it all takes place in the heavens <clears throat> at twilight, where a lucky star and a guardian angel are assigned a, they've been assigned a human ward and they've been looking after the human ward their whole life unfortunately they have done such a good job of protecting him that he has become a deranged crazed um <laughs> despot essentially and yet the star and the guardian adore him and they can't imagine anything terrible so here's this terrible man that does these terrible things and they still want to protect him because they're crazy about him but then they start to notice oh my goodness, some of the other humans are getting really upset with some of the things he's doing. So how do we save him from himself? So again, it's it's a very funny, it, it, it's just meant to be funny. It's outrageous and it's funny. And it's kind of inspired by like every single bad leader in the, his, the world, the history of the world has been incorporated into this character. <clears throat> and then I also use outrageous plays to do a darker edge. I do do some dramas that are darker. And my first play ever produced was produced in March of 2016 at the um, Manhattan Repertory Theater. And that was called The Muse. And The Muse is about a writer who is tormented by this little green goblin, which is his muse that gives him all the ideas for his stories. And it really, I mean, it is about this guy that's tormented by this little demon that gives him ideas that also torment him. But the whole thing could really be an allegory, uh, allegory for mental illness, because the whole thing is that the news might not even exist. He could just be, you know, completely um, schizophrenic or dislocated. And this whole thing is in his head. And the green news is a manifestation of that illness. So even though it's got comedic elements, it is very dark in a lot of ways. And it is um, very psychological. And I really like that piece. That's that's my first play I ever wrote, and I think it's quite strong. I'm quite proud of it. And then I have another play coming up um, this year in June. It's going to be at the uh, Latia Theater as part of New York Summerfest, and it's called Stalemates. And it takes place in, in basically a purgatory uh, with a chess set, black and white. And it's two ghosts, two sisters, and they're going over their lives, and they're kind of trapped in this purgatory, and they're going back and forth about everything that they did in their life. And how it wasn't really right or wrong, but that gray area in between. And again, it's a it's a darker piece, but I think that it also lends itself well to experimental theater. 
And then on top of that, I also write children's theater too. So there you go. You got the whole gambit there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're very creative and prolific. So speaking of mental health and speaking of darker issues, I wanted to bring our listeners up to speed on a project that you and I collaborated on called Her Garden, a film project. Could you tell them what the heck this is and how I somehow convinced you to be a part of it? Well, I love working with Christine. Anybody listening to this, we've collaborated a lot. She's a great actress. She's acted in my crazy plays. She's illustrated a children's book of mine that's coming out soon. Because as I said, it's funny. I'm primarily known as a horror writer. If you look me up on YouTube under Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a lot of my horror short stories will come up. And Chilling Tales does great professional narrations of them. But I also write kids books. So again, the whole gambit. So we love working together. And Christine had this this project that had been shot when she was in college and nothing had ever been done with it. And it was basically just this very experimental film. It went on for over an hour and it was just these, a lot of different images. Um, and she asked me just to take a look at this film and to see if I could come up with a story for it. So I love, and as I just said previously, I love experimental theater. Experimental theater is my thing. So experimental film is a short, a short hop from experimental theater. So I thought, oh, this sounds like fun. So what I did is that I cleared my mind completely and I sat down with a notepad and a pen and I started watching the film. And I just started jotting down anything that came to me as I was watching it. And one thing that I noticed about this film was that even though it was a lot of like seemingly random scenes, quote unquote, there were two really consistent themes that I noticed. The first was water. There was a lot of imagery of water, whether it be ocean, ponds, rain, um, just water, like drain, sewage systems, just water, water everywhere, essentially. And then there was also a lot of scenes from like the inner city, a uh, very urban environment, urban landscapes. So as I was watching this, um, I'm a huge fan of fantasy, always have been. So when I saw the water, the first thing that comes to my mind, of course, is mermaids. But then when you look at the more gritty aspects of this film, uh, which are very urban, I was like, yeah, you know, this could not be a fantasy. This needs to be rooted in realism. But how do I work mermaids into that? And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if there was a character in this film who suffers from mental illness, who is delusional, and for whatever reason, her delusion the center on the idea that mermaids really exist. She's completely convinced of this, and she's obsessed with water, and she happens to live in an urban landscape. And from there, I came up with the concept for her garden. And if anybody hasn't seen the film or is interested in, in what's about her garden, an experimental film, I think it's like an hour and 20 minutes, so it is a feature length. But it is supposed to take place um, at around maybe anywhere from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. in the mind of a woman who was tossing and turning one night. She's having difficulty sleeping and she's kind of in and out of dreams. She's in and out of consciousness and um, unconsciousness. She's kind of playing between running th like um, running thoughts in your mind and dreams. And, you know, it it's interesting because I think we've all had nights like that where you're kind of like in and out and you can't really sleep, but you're not totally awake either. And that's what this is. So this woman is kind of going over events in her life um, that also primarily center on her relationship with her aunt, who was mentally ill, who she kind of looked after when she was younger. Um, and it it really is an interesting piece because I wanted it to represent um, the bonds that people form with one another and how even people who maybe lived in unideal circumstances can still find ways to look back on some of those memories uh, with joy and then also acknowledge these, also acknowledge like the sadness and the struggle at the same time. So I think it's a very interesting piece. I'm very pleased with how it turned out. And I really, I love the voiceover work that you did with it, Christine. You really brought it to life. And we worked with a wonderful, wonderful uh, sound designer who created a marvelous or found a marvelous uh, intro and extra song which is really um, haunting and beautiful and perfectly paired for the film. So I was really impressed by it. Yeah, and 
that sound designer's name is Jacob Barron, and we cannot break wait to bring this film to the world. So that is something that we're working on right now, getting it into film festivals and galleries, etc. All right, Megan, one last question before it's time to go is how does your creative practice relate to your work in education and journalism? Um, well, the journalism, I'm actually a freelance journalist and I use my journalism position. I write for a number of different publications and I use it to interview people who are involved with arts entertainment or lifestyle and leisure. So I don't cover any hard news like politics or crime. Um, but I interview artists. I interview people who are involved with animal rescue or charities. I interview people that own their own companies, maybe are clothing designers or invented something. Um, as long as it's lifestyle, leisure, and arts entertainment, I'm happy to use it to bring attention to people that make positive impacts. Um, one industry I do a lot of work for is the toy and game industry, and I love that industry. It's a wonderful, wonderful industry. Um, I'd love to design my own toys one day, but that's another story. But anyway, um, the journalism has helped me make a lot of connections. It's helped me make a lot of friends. I currently am, am my favorite journalism position currently is that I work freelance with a Long Island newspaper called Newsday. And they have this wonderful little series called Faces of Long Island. So if you're listening to this and if you have a connection to Long Island, whether you live there, work there, or were born there, um, Basically, what we do is that we conduct these little interviews with people who have an interesting life or an interesting hobby, or maybe they overcame an illness, and we write about them, and they're just these very sweet, inspirational stories that show the people that make up Long Island. So I really love that series, and I wish that there was something like it for New York City as well, because you would get so many interesting stories from the city. Um, so that's very rewarding. And I find that that has really helped me make connections with other artists. And it's helped me give other artists free press, which is very, very important because it can be very hard to get recognition, even when it's very deserved. So I like using that um, it, because I have that ability and I have that platform. I like using it to help other creators. As far as my, my work work goes, uh, my full time job is that I am a college professor. I am actually the head of an English department for a school in the online division. Online education is my area. I love teaching online and I'm getting my PhD to design online programs and courses. And the way that art informs that is um, really, I teach creative writing courses. I teach creative thinking courses. I also teach standard English courses and communication courses. But I really love working on the creative writing courses the most because it's so fun to see what my students come up with and it's so fun to read the stories and my um the other aspect of this is that i'm currently working on a phd i'm almost finished i hope to be done either this year or maybe next year um but hopefully this year and i'm basically finished with everything but the dissertation and i am using my dissertation to see if children can learn very advanced vocabulary words like bewildered and loquacious from reading children's books with these words front and centered in them. So I'm essentially writing and publishing children's books and then using them as a basis for a doctoral study. So in that way, art and literature directly impact my PhD work. Um, and it also impacts work I do with adults because I think that adults can learn a lot of new words and stuff from stories and they enjoy that. So in my life, like everything informs everything else, essentially. Um, the English work is obviously in the writing is different from the visual arts, but they help one another because if I'm doing a lot of work with writing and on the computer, it's nice to get away and focus on the visual arts. And similarly, if I'm working on visual arts and I'm painting and I'm sculpting, sometimes it's nice to take a break from that and go back to the written word. So I always do the two of them, you know, side by side, but it's nice to do one thing and then do the other. And it just kind of, ebbs and flows nicely yeah your practice is so multifaceted but like you said everything informs everything there's the ebb there's a flow well thank you so much Megan for taking the time to talk about your art and some of your writing and journalism and educational work this has been Christine Stoddard with the Badass Lady Folk formerly of Brooklyn but now of everywhere just taping from home. Thanks for listening and tune in next time.